Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Body Wisdom Podcast, where we discuss the mind-body connection and its relationship to health and well-being. My name is Tammy Bullmash, and today we have a very special guest all the way from San Francisco, Dr. Eric Pepper. Dr. Eric Pepper is an international authority on biofeedback and self-regulation. Since 1970, he has been researching factors that promote healing. He is a professor of holistic health studies at the Department of Health Education at San Francisco State University. He is the president of the Biofeedback Foundation of Europe and past president of the Association for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback. He holds senior fellow certification from the Biofeedback Certification Institute of America. He was the behavioral scientist for the United States Rhythmic Gymnastics Team. He has a biofeedback practice at Biofeedback Health, www.biofeedbackhealth.org. He received the 2004 California Governor's Safety Award for his work on healthy computing. And in 2013, he received the Biofeedback Distinguished Scientist Award in recognition of outstanding career and scientific contributions from the Association for Applied Psychophysiology. He is an author of numerous scientific articles and books, such as Make Health Happen, Fighting Cancer, A Non-Toxic Approach to Treatment, Healthy Computing with Muscle Biofeedback, and Biofeedback Mastery. He publishes the blog, The Pepper Perspective, Ideas on Illness, Health, and Well-Being at www.pepperperspective.com. He is a recognized expert on holistic health, stress management, and workplace health, and has been featured on abcnews.com and in GQ, Glamour, Men's Health, the San Francisco Chronicle, Shape, and Women's Health. His research interests focus on self-healing strategies to optimize health, illness prevention, the effects of posture and respiration, and learning self-mastery with biofeedback. Hi, Eric, and welcome to our show. Well, Tammy, thank you so much for your generous introduction. It's way too long. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not long enough considering uh, how much more there is no. to say about you. <laughs> uh, but I'm so happy to have you, Eric. The last time I saw you was in, t- in 2018 at the AAPB, the 49th Annual Convention, the Association yep. for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback. And that was so much fun when you invited me to come and present with you. But we did a great job. I thought it was phenomenal how we how we blended combining biofeedback and posture concepts with the Alexander technique because it's a love it's an approach that applies for everybody to optimize their health. Absolutely, so it's great to collaborate together. It was wonderful. We wrote also the article together, which the Alexander com- technique community absolutely loved. Which we will hopefully have time when all this is over to <laughs> the pandemic goes away, we can follow up on that again, but that was fantastic. And one of the things that I remember that I, that I took with me from that was something that you did. You put a timer on and every 30 minutes, you wanted us all mid presentation, whatever we were doing, you want us all to stop, take a break and stretch. And I, I thought that was brilliant because it didn't matter if we were presenting or talking, that timer went off and we stopped. And it was such a great way to regroup to recalibrate, to just move our bodies, and um, and you introduced that to me. So thank you for that. Today, I want to talk about your latest endeavor, because I know you're up to lots of projects all the time, but this latest one is wonderful. You wrote a book called Tech Stress. I think that this book really is a must-read for First of all, everybody, especially everyone in the Western part of the world that spends most of their time on some kind of electronic device and also sitting down. As we know now, most Westerners spend about 11 hours a day sitting down. That's uh, at work and also after work, just slouching around in front of their computer or TV. And so, Eric, I wanted to ask you, what inspired you to write this book? Well, the inspiration comes from a couple of things. One, working with students. Because when students are, what, what the world has changed and students mainly just sit much more. They sit in lectures historically. Now they all sit in front of screens doing Zoom classes. And we play, we socialize, we play games all sitting. So that is one part. And that led us to the kind of simple observations that as you sit, your energy just drops. That's one for most people. And if you're watching 
you know, some streaming services, what happens is you watch one show and then you automatically watch the next one. I mean, it's programmed that way and you, it's hard to get up. So you feel yourself almost getting slightly depressed. So that's one piece. And then students reported as we did surveys on it that many of them had neck and shoulder pains or other issues, which you would say deals with digital uh, issues. And then there were social issues that when, when, when you now work with people or you meet them, then have a good discussion. What happens is their phone goes off and they distract themselves and check for a moment who was there. And what was very clear when people did that, they both for a moment took their social attention away, but really it was a break in social connections. And each of the students and people who I talk about with would report when, this, when you do that, you feel a break in that connection. You feel a little bit diminished. And yet, if you ask the students, you all experience that they all do it. So that led to looking at that, thinking about that. And then much earlier was the experience working with people at work sites that many people, you know, it's just who, who work on computers, develop neck, shoulder pain, especially eye problems. The world becomes more blurry. And by the end of the day, they are just exhausted. And most of the interventions historically, that's how we started, was ergonomics. You know, the issue is it's how you're sitting. And in reality, that's all, it is critical that the equipment you use, your setup is primary as one piece. It's foundational, but that's all it is. If you give someone a perfect chair and arrange that perfectly, it gives the person the opportunity to sit correctly. It has no meaning that they do. And that was our major contribution, myself, Rick Harvey and others, that we observe that. And then we use physiology monitoring of their neck and shoulders and other parts of the body to show that when a person thought they were relaxed, they were still tense, etc. And that has led us to thoughts, not just from posture, but from a whole system perspective. We are all the pieces. And then we found that when people changed, when we taught them some changes, not just ergonomics alone, doing breaks, becoming somatically aware, checking how they were thinking about their task, then their health improved. And that was really the foundation for it. And to me, especially now with COVID, where we all, most people have shifted to, to, so, to working, dating, socializing, entertaining, learning and teaching online, all we do is we sit. And even I am guilty of that because when I used to you know, <laughs> teach, yes, all, all of your hands can go up, right? <laughs> And we just sit and sit. And as you can see, I am just sitting now. And before COVID, I would walk take, walk from my house to the, to the BART station. Then I would walk to the university. I would walk up and down stairs. And without any effort, without thinking about it, I did about 12,000 steps. You know, good and compulsive using my watch to know. Now, I sit. And if I do 2,000 steps, it's a lot. Unless I now have to use willpower. <laughs> To, to get myself to be activated now by doing friends, et cetera. And that is the big shift. And if you look again at the whole shift from almost working at the typewriter to computers, to laptops, to, to, to you working now mainly in your cell phone, there are all ways in which you are more and more passive and often put into challenging positions, which you, you're totally unaware of, your head is forward, you have all this strain in your neck, and that is just normal. And what we now see with students, and that's partly because of isolation of COVID, et cetera, is a significant increase in isolation, loneliness, anxiety, and depression. And part of that is also how we are using ourselves. And so that was really the background to say, huh, what are the factors we have observed in research how can we put it together as a holistic package? Because the answer is different for different people. We all want to just give you, give the person only one solution. It's easy. Just get a new chair, <laughs> get a new computer screen. Right. It isn't quite like that. It's how you use, it's both the environment and how you're using yourself and how you bring yourself to that. 
So yes. I think that's the uh, that's basically I think the start, and it was anchored really with one of the first people we ever saw. I was a consultant for a patient or a client for a colleague of mine who had neck and shoulder pains, who was working at work, and an ergonomist had arranged the desk perfectly. All the angles were correct. And yet the person continued to have discomfort. And that was that insight to say, ah, how you're working. If you're working with stress like this, the perfect condition of ergonomics are not gonna solve it. You need to deal with both your body, but also the cognitions, the emotions that are involved. And then we change that, all of a sudden the person could become aware. But maybe I should give people an example how so many of us work yes. without knowing. So if you take an example, holding your dominant hand, your mouse you would be using, for example. So you just hold the mouse. And now in a moment, I'm going to ask you to draw the letters of your street address. Each letter with the mouse and except start at the last letter of the street address. So if my office is Derby Street, then I would first draw the letter T, then I would sort of click, then I would draw the letter E, and I would go backwards and make this letter height only a half inch, very small. And then I want you to do it as quickly as possible. So now, if you don't have a mouse there, just hold an object to simulate the mouse. It's unimportant. Are you ready to do it? Mm -hmm, I'm ready. Yes. Ready, get set, go. Really, each letter is less than half an inch height. Do it quicker, quicker, quicker. Don't make a mistake. Quicker, quicker, quicker. And are you holding your breath? Are you tightening your shoulders? Are you tightening your trunk? Are you raising your shoulders possibly, holding all this tension? If you are like most people who do this task, you, you did all that and you were totally unaware. We are usually really unaware of our body posture. And imagine working like that for many hours. And that's how people work. They don't know it. And what makes this different now compared to, let's say, working in a typewriter, which our parents did, or our grandparents did. At a typewriter, yes, you would be focused. You would be sitting up. However, you had a teacher in, in junior high school who would teach you how to type. You went to typing class. They taught you how to sit. And without any effort, you would take breaks. What do you mean breaks? Well, you finish typing. That's all, even if your shoulders were tight while typing, at that moment, you would have to hit return. Or if you had a selector, you use your pinky. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you finish that page, you had to take your hands away from the keyboard. You would twist the paper, take it out, put it down or get up and file. So embedded in the task were many alternations of movement, which habitually we no longer do. Now we just sit captured by the screen. We sit in the same position the whole time. And the more we get captured, the more we tend to go forward, the more we slouch. Just look at almost anybody who's watching, you know, streaming video sitting on a couch. Their spine is perfectly curved. They have a crook in the neck. They're looking like this. They're really like you know, sitting. That posture also affects cognitions and emotions. And that is the intrinsic process. We use that people think you have body and you have thoughts and emotions. No, we are embodied. Thoughts affect body. Every thought, every emotion is a body response and every body response affects our emotions. And that is what we so often have forgotten. And psychology especially, I think, has been errorful to not look at the body, how the body affects the thoughts and emotions. Absolutely. I mean, that was just, I think, a perfect example of that when you said to think about the street address and to think of it backwards. I mean, the concentration that goes into, okay, I've got to spell this backwards and I've got to do this fast. And already that thought creates tension because I've got to do this fast and you're holding. So this is just like one example, but when you're working throughout the day and it's important and you're working on a paper, whatever, email, and you're tensing, the whole time you're clutching that 
that mouse and you're not just clicking on it like as if you're just practicing to click on it. I mean, you're gripping it. It's it's a completely different, and that's not even to say anything about the keyboard, <laughs> you know, and everything else that, that we use. So that's a perfect example of the mind-body connection and how your thoughts and what you're doing impact the direct use with your hand or whatever part of your body you're engaging in that, that moment. Yes, and people really forget that when they're working, they hold these muscles, and usually not massively tight, just a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then you say to yourself, what do you mean? So what? You know, it shouldn't make any difference. Well, remember, muscles are not tendons or bones, or are not ligaments or bones, which are evolved to hold under certain tension. Muscles, the function is to tighten and let go. Mm -hmm. And when that happens appropriately, that they can regenerate every time you let go. And what happens is that when we work, our shoulders are slightly up. We don't know it. You can't even see it often. Mm -hmm. And yet it is. And it's this low level of tension that gives a problem. Let me give it as an example of this. Mm -hmm. What I'd like you just to do as, as you're sitting here, or just lift your right foot up from the floor by about an, an inch, not very much. You know, it's an analogy that I'll be doing. So now the foot is lifted from the floor by about an inch. And slowly as you hold this, you can start feeling some tension happening in the hip flexors, right? Mm -hmm. In your hip, the muscles of your, almost the upper thigh, you can start feeling mm -hmm. near the hip, feel it more. And I could ask the question, how long can you hold this up? It will depend how much I pay you to do this. <laughs> But still keep holding it. And when you have humor, you can forget about it for a moment, but then you come back and slowly you can feel some discomfort building up. Now just let it go. Let the legs really, now you can shake the legs, let it go, let it get loose. Notice during the tightness, you reduce the blood supply, you build up waste products. And it's only during the letting go do they regenerate. Now, this process occurs equally in our neck and shoulders and our back without any awareness or anywhere in our face if we clench our jaw or whatever. And yet, and if we do this constantly, we get into trouble. And now go back to the hip flexor, which we just lifted a little bit. Remember, when you use these muscles appropriately, you have no problem. I mean, if you go for a walk, even for miles, remember, in the swing phase, the forward, you would be tightening that same muscle almost as much or probably much more, but then you would let it relax. It would regenerate and get ready for the next time. And notice what the rule here is, muscles need to tighten and let go. And the real key is that so often we are totally unaware that we are tightening these muscles or we're holding our breath. And again, if you think of our book, on tech stress, really how, you know, technology has really hijacked ourselves. That unbe unbeknown to ourselves, we hold our breaths. And so the first tip I can think of for home practice for anyone, start observing where you're holding your breath. Because it really means I go, <gasps> and if I do that, I'm activating myself. My blood pressure may go up, whatever it is for you. If I can remember that and breathe lower, already I'm developing some stress management techniques. It's beautiful. Everything you're saying is very much in line with what we teach also with the Alexander Technique. And I wanted to kind of just share with our listeners and our viewers a little bit more about your book because it's phenomenal. It, it starts by offering some really staggering statistics that were even alarming to me. I had not realized, but I guess they've just gotten... It's just gotten worse over time. So um, it, what it used to be when I did my research, it wasn't even this high. <laughs> and now it's so one in two adults, one in two adults report a musculoskeletal condition requiring medical attention. One out of every three office workers in the U.S. experiences back pain. 55 million employees report recurring fatigue. 45 million have back injuries linked to computer use. 45 million workers suffer from tension headaches or carpal tunnel syndrome. More than 30% of North Americans who work at a computer develop a muscle strain injury every year. And a survey reported that 85% 
of high school students experience tension or pain in their neck, shoulders, back, or wrists after working at a computer. Not only that, the more time they spend on social media, the greater their risk for depression. So uh, this is pretty alarming, to say the least. Well, it's even worse than that. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's, it, it gets worse. You know, it gets worse and worse. When, when I did my research, I think it was like half of our waking hours were spent sitting down, which they said like was like five to seven. Now it's 11 hours we're spending a day sitting down. It's probably worse with pandemic when people are home. They're not ever leaving like a seated position. They're just doing that all day. Maybe they're going to the bathroom or eating and they're still sitting when they're doing both those things. So it's sad. Your, your book really talks about the evolution of the human species and how, where we started and the hunters and gatherers. I mean, this book is really a must read. That's all I can say, because I wish we had time to talk about every single chapter of your book. How did your, how did you and your colleagues come about this realization that, hey, we need help? What was the, the, what was it? Well, it's like, it's, the, why do we need help? Because we are basically captured. That's the hardest part for people to realize. Our dysfunctional patterns at the computer we just did earlier, for example, I can think of many others. These are really survival mechanisms which are activated. These allowed us to thrive and survive in earlier times. Let me think about it out loud. I, I'm walking through the savannah or the jungle and in the far distance or in the periphery, I see some subtle movement. Well, what do I have to do? That could be friend or foe. I it could be a predator. So by definition, we are wired without awareness that we are prey. We don't know that, but we were. You know, there were a lot of predators. We were great food sources for some of them. But it's only very <laughs> recently that we that we are at the top of the chain. Right, right. And so when I when I, this periphery occurs, when I see something, I automatically need to find out. I often will freeze because when I freeze, I don't move. And when I don't move, I'm less visible for a predator. All of us know that the airport, when we go to the airport and we're, we're looking for friends and you just stand there and don't move, you're hard to discriminate. But if you go, yay, me, me, <laughs> you'll see. Except right. you don't want to do that to a predator. Second, <laughs> when you freeze, you see, when you freeze, in addition, you're, you stop your breathing, that means your hearing becomes more acute. You hear a little bit more. And again, so now you freeze, you hold your breath. There's nothing wrong with this because if the predator doesn't see you and eventually you go away, you can let go and you survive and you thrive. However, if you did not react that way and became aware, very soon you would be lunch. And that, so these mechanisms are wired into us. And so there are a number of them. So now think, now we sit in front of a computer screen. What, what happens? On the screen, we continually get visual changes that recapture us. And if you think of most computer games for kids, for example, you can see they're wired, they're created to capture the child's attention with novelty. The child is a continued responder to the stimuli, not an initiator. And I think that is the real harm of many of these games. Yes. Second, when we just sit, we have to focus. We have no choice almost because our eyes want to see. And then we keep focusing at this near distance. This is totally different than how we used to work, live in, in nature in earlier times. Think in earlier times I'm walking, I look at the far distance. When I look at the far distance, my eyes can diverge, basically, then I relax. They can look far away. The muscles around the lens relax to be able to focus in the far distance. It's really full relaxation. Then when I look at the screen, my eyes converge again nearby. The muscles tighten. I don't know I do any of that. It happens automatically. The trouble is now we mainly watch in front of the screen. We focus. So now you get near vision, digital stress, visual stress. And if you look at young people who have used com computers and cell phones mainly for most of their lives, for example, like in Singapore, where you also may live in small rooms where the wall is not very far away, 85% of the children become myopic. And China, in fact, has just last year made a whole new government rule about this whole part. You can only 
work on a computer, play games only so many hours a day because myopia, nearsightedness, is become epidemic in the world. On the other hand, if you go to you know, hunting and gathering groups, whether it's the Kung Bushmen, whether it is anyone who works, who, who walks through the desert, their vision, even at age 40, is still often even 2010, not 2020, their vision is still much better. So all of a sudden we realize that if you take a child, the eyes in some sense early on, that whole structure is still developing and changing. Our bodies are plastic. We have plasticity and we adapt. However, some of these adaptations lead to harm. And it's very interesting in the most recent observations of athletes at the college level, you realize that the average athlete who comes in no longer is totally erect and tall, surprisingly. They now, have, they now walk in and they think this is normal with their normal iPhone upper body structure. Wow. You know, it's noticeable. You can see this now, at least in observation. It's never true for everybody. However, it's becoming predominant. And if you look around the world, then you can see, at least in the US and all our industrial world, how do people walk? They walk holding a cell phone in their hand often. They're not making social contact. They're looking down. Now ask yourself in your body structure, what does it do to you when your head is predominantly looking down at your cell phone. By definition, if using a laptop, your head has to look down because the keyboard, unless you use an external screen or something. And even at the computer, you tend to look down so often. That is becoming our normal way. If you think of my, my head posture, when I'm sort of really tall, more or less, this is nicely aligned. Then, from us, just like in the Alexander technique, the head may weigh 15, 20, you know, 15 pounds or something in terms of the, the effort the muscles have to do. The muscles are really quite relaxed. They don't have to do much work to hold the head in balance. Just slightly because, you know, we're, the, we're slightly forward in terms of weight possibly, not much. But when I go into my cell phone look, where my head is at 60 degrees or so, now the same forces it's equivalent to 60 pounds, between 45 and 60 pounds, except I'm totally unaware that these muscles are tightening because if they didn't tighten, my head would just go plop. But I have it hold it up. This takes massive, covert, unaware tension efforts to hold the head up. And over time, that's what brings into pathology. And, it, and it's much worse than that because when I let my head collapse, I'm doing two more things. I am collapsing downward. I put my body into a position, which is really usually a position of powerlessness, defeatedness. That's one. Two, that is on the psychological side, you could say. And on the physiological side, when I collapse, I'm really, you could say, compressing. You can't compress it, really. The abdomen, and it means that my abdomen no longer has any movement as I breathe. My diaphragm can't go down as much, and I breathe slightly higher. All of this happens without awareness and leads to more increased pathology. You know, and it, it's, I mean, maybe I should just talk about posture for an instant in that sense, what happens. And we have done a number of studies. It's fun. Yeah. You know, we, we do it in three different ways. One, we use some muscle biofeedback. You know, we use EMGs from thought technology or others where you monitor from the body and you can show that people are unaware of their tension. They really are. It's mind boggling. <laughs> I mean, you know, and we have done studies with physical therapists and they all would say, I can, I know, that I can measure it. I can feel it. I can only promise you I have not yet met one. They're close, but they really, we are really unaware of these subtle tensions because we shouldn't be aware. Why should I be attending to my muscles? I need to be aware where my hand goes, not how I use my arm or shoulders. But yet it makes a difference. In terms of posture, we've done some studies where you can, you can use devices such as, uh, there are many different ones, but the ones we have used is like an upright go or upright, you know, mm -hmm. It makes a difference which one they are. They're a device you can put in your spine and you can, and they work on your cell phone. And then once you have been calibrated that you're upright, whatever that means, 
there's some real questions what that means but that's then each time you slouch on the it vibrates and it's shocking when you do this yourself that you realize i never realized i slouched there and when you now do this if students and people in industry then what they observe are a couple of things one they slouch or they bend forward call it that way when they're reaching to the screen i call that almost ergonomic factors and there's nothing wrong when you do it sometimes. You should do this. We should be moving. The second is when we have hopeless, helpless thoughts. We don't realize that, but when we get more depressed, what is our body posture of depression? Generally, I know some people can be way upright and be depressed, <laughs> but as a general rule, we tend to slouch and collapse, pull in. So when I have a thought like that, my body slightly goes down. Now it would buzz. It would remind me. And then you can ask yourself, what's going on? Ergonomics? No, maybe the Or I'm tired and exhausted, whatever it may be. So it's a cue to help you become aware. And I find those remarkably useful. But let me give an example. We've been talking for a little while. Time has flown. And so what I'd like you just to do, check yourself for a moment. Rate your own energy as a listener. Rate how you feel your mood. And now just for a moment, get up. Just get up. And if you're driving, you can't do that, I'm sorry. But at least if you're sitting, get up for a moment, maybe interlace your fingers, your, your fingers for a moment in front of you. And now just make big circles and then the arms go up. Just take a deep breath and the arms go down, let the air go out. And then go around and then the opposite way and follow your eyes where you're looking with your palms. And then the opposite way again. You're supposed to enjoy it. And now you can even reach up with each arm, alternately, and almost for fun, like a little kid. Just skip in place. Just really skip. You can do it. And put a smile on your face. Okay, enough. Oh, that's so fun. This is, see, even here you implement the 30 minutes. I love that, Eric. That's so, it's wonderful. But I want to do two parts. I'll answer that. Yes. One, did you notice a slight difference in your energy level? Of course feel better and your mood got slightly better yes no yes. and you can see this especially with little kids when little kids are locked up at home right now they go you know they go really have difficulty yeah. they need to play and what is play play is where you work intensely and then you rest you alternate we have forgotten that magical combination that when we sit we need to move and that leads to the whole pathology of sitting because people have said sitting is the new smoking they're sort of right uh, the part of the reason is that we no longer activate the muscles in our legs and if you think about the blood flow and the lymph return from the legs and upward that occurs when the muscles tighten and let go so the calf muscle is often called the second heart and the reason it's called the second heart is because as the, the, the heart pumps the blood down, eventually to the legs, the way it comes up is that the muscles around the veins tighten when you move. They squeeze the veins, pushing the blood upward a bit. And there are these one-way valves inside the vein. And so when what we just did by even standing or standing your toes, heel, toe kind of exercises, you're tightening your calf muscles and the major muscles in your legs, which support the blood return to the body. So in fact, your heart has to work less hard. And also you may get a little bit less edema in your legs, which happens for some people as they get, you know, that occurs. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, movement is critical. And I use an automatic reminder. So on my computer screen, for example, I have a little software program. It doesn't cost anything. So this one is cost, it's called stretchbreak.com. You can download it for free and it pops up. You can set the scale, the time, and it will pop up on my screen to remind me Eric Pepper, or it doesn't say Eric Pepper, by the way. <laughs> it just said, it just, the music goes on and it reminds me to do the activity. And I have learned to listen to that because the impulse is automatically, just as we are talking for a moment, to say, ah, I don't have time for that. It's gonna interrupt my work. 
And what I have learned is if I do do those movements, I don't have back pain or my, my back doesn't get tired. I have more energy by the end of the day. And I learned this a long time ago when we worked with a group of employees at the university. We we're doing a whole program, basically how to transfer tech stress into tech health. And many of these practices in our book, you know, we have practiced, we explored those. And I'll never forget one man, you know, who basically came in and said, I have no problems. I, feel, <laughs> I don't understand any of this stuff, nothing. Uh, you know, there's yeah. nothing wrong with me, right? Of course, and I, of course. I agree. And I said, well, do an experiment. And I rec really recommend always do experiments. That means it's not a lifelong commitment. Just do it for a couple of days. And I said, do an experiment where literally every half an hour you, you run this program. Well, we finally persuaded to do it. You know, a little bit of resistance, but since he was part of this group, <laughs> this called peer pressure, he did it. He comes back the following week with this kind of sheepish smile, almost embarrassment, you know, but real realistically, he said, you know, there's life after five. And what he really meant by that is at the end of the workday, he used to be more tired. And now when he finished the workday, he wow. didn't feel tired anymore. Because by taking these breaks, you allow the body to regenerate. They're not long breaks. They're just short, interruptive breaks. And they are critical to do. Yes. And let me, you know, let me go one more time in terms of posture, because I think it's so important. Mm -hmm. We forget that. So you can just, you know, and, and posture is highly related to the ergonomic setup. If my screen is down, I automatically have to look down. So where I monitor to set the screen up and all those rule guidelines we recommend in, in the book, and I will not go through them. I don't have time anyway. But in terms of posture, remember when you collapse, you almost evoke hopeless, helpless thoughts. You don't know it. So let me just do a little fun exercise with everyone, totally differently. There are other ones in the book. So what I'd like you to do is just stand up and just stand. And now I'd like you to adapt a body posture where you felt de defeated and hopeless and evoke a memory of your past and really feel that memory when you felt kind of defeated and hopeless and helpless. Just evoke that memory and feel that feeling, really make that memory as real as possible. So you have to kind of defeated body posture, evoke that memory, let that be as real as possible. I'll let you do this for a few seconds. And then when you sort of have that feeling in this body position, just nod your head. And for some it takes longer than others, but for now that's enough. Now let that go. Now I'd like you to adopt a posture of empowerment of being, of being a winner, you know, where you really, everything is going well. You're optimistic. It's great. You just get the best news possible. And now take that body posture, really also looking up. And if this body posture while looking up in a sense, really evoke that past memory when you really had this optimistic, positive experience, empowering experience. Really evoke that. Pull, make that memory as real as possible. And when you have that memory as real as possible, take a few minutes, you know, a few seconds to build it up more. Great. Now, put yourself back in this kind of defeated, hopeless body posture you did before. Really get yourself in that body position again. Make it as real as possible. And now in this hopeless, helpless, defeated body posture, this powerless posture, submissive posture, i like you to hold that posture and now really evoke and feel your optimistic, empowering memory. Don't change your posture. Just really evoke and, and, and you know, evoke and really feel and think of that optimistic, empowering memory. I'll give you a few seconds, really do that. Okay, we can do this longer. For some of you, it takes more time. And now let that go. Now put yourself back in this dominant, positive, empowering position. You know, your shoulders, you're standing tall, you're looking slightly up in a certain way. 
And now in this positive position, hold that position, and now evoke that hopeless, helpless memory, make it as real as possible. Really make it as real as possible while you keep your body configured in this empowered position. Enough, good, thank you. You may have to do this at a longer time for yourselves, but I think probably, but what did you experience? And if I think about that, that uh, I could ask Tammy, what did you ex experience? How That's was it to evoke? Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Uh, this, Eric, this, uh, I've cited this particular study that you've done with um, posture and mood uh, several mm -hmm. times because I love it so much. But what I experienced now for myself, because I never tried it, what I found was um, when when I was in the, the, you know, I obviously could sense the relationship between the mood and posture very strongly, but particularly when I was in the defeated posture or postural holding position, um, I found that when I was thinking of the, the positive state of the more ideal, it was a lot easier for me to want to come up like it was easier it was that force of 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 that up when i just thought about the up it was like my body wanted to go up my mind body wanted to go up and when i was in more so but not significantly more so when i was started with the 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 holding position of the ideal mood or the better mood and i was thinking then down i i was coming down but i started i think so up that it was not as quick of a down because I started up. But it's interesting with the force, though, of the, the positive thinking, how I really found that if I, the more I thought, it was harder for me to just stay down like that. It really worked. It's amazing, amazing. And I never tried yeah. it. I, 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 you know, cite this article and I never tried it myself. Well, now I did. <laughs> well, this is really a different one than the article we did. Okay. Well, this is a funny thing. It's, but it's the same concept. Mm -hmm. But what people observe, and what you observe, if you're in this collapsed position, mm -hmm. I think almost everybody finds it was just harder to access or be really involved in the positive memory, or you, you know, you couldn't quite get into it unless you almost what you said, you feel your body changing to the upper position. And vice versa, when you're in the upper position, it doesn't mean you cannot think of negative thoughts or hopeless mm -hmm. thoughts. However, if you keep that up position, it's just as if you're slightly more removed from it initially, mm -hmm. from the emotional impact. Mm -hmm. And now, once you see this, and that's what our studies show, that when people are in the collapsed position, it's much easier for almost all of them to access hopeless, helpless, powerless thoughts and memories. And in the upper position, slightly, it's easier to access the more empowering positive because thoughts and body are not separate. Mm -hmm. And so, and now ask, how are we configuring ourselves during the day? How are we standing and sitting? Am I configuring myself the whole day with a cell phone looking down? Notice if I do this, I'm configuring my body, as I said earlier, to have more easy access to hopeless, helpless thoughts and feelings. And it'll just be harder to access positive thoughts and feelings. Now, it's obviously also true that some people, because of neurological disorders, etc., they are, they don't have, the, they may not be able to change it. So it is not a hundred percent rule. However, for most people, posture covertly impacts this massively. And when we did this study with Yi Mei Lin in Taiwan, we showed that when you record the electrical activity of the head and the EEG, you can really see that in the slouched position, people's brains have to work harder to access positive thoughts than in the up position. And how are we all configuring ourselves now? When we are watch, when we're watching streaming on, t on, on the TV or on our screens, we are slouching. No wonder that we are getting more of an epidemic of depression. I'm not saying this is the only factor, not at all, but it's one piece that gives more support to the system to start becoming more hopeless, to more depressed, to be less active. And most of us know that when we do activities, when we complete a task, we feel better. 
you know, and think of our language. The, you know, there are downers in the world, or there are uppers. Yes. Our language embeds this. Yes. And we forget, and this is all part of tech stress. And I think that's what people forget. In technology stress, we only think usually, most people think it's only the keyboard or the ergonomics. It is much more. Oh, you're amazing. You are just so amazing, Eric. I oh, I want to do a three-hour podcast with you. I know. Well, I did want to talk a little bit more about something that struck me. This was in chapter five, which was the inactivity, why sitting is the new smoking. And so we did talk a little bit about that, but you, you gave an example that I really liked. So it was on varying tasks where you described alternating time at the computer with opportunities to move or be active. So when you change to a different type of task or movement, you're using different muscles. And this interrupts the contraction of muscle fibers that allows them to rest. So you use the example of, let's say, interrupting uh, typing with doing something like getting up and filling the paper in the printer or making a telephone call while standing. So why is it so important for the muscles to perform different activities? Because we've talked a lot about, you know, being, you know, sedentary, but what's, what's the reason? The major reason is that when we are working and sitting or however body position, we, especially now with the computer, we stay frozen in that same body position. So if our hand is on the mouse or on the trackpad, our shoulders are slightly forward, most likely you would not know it, but if you're monitored like the physiologically, with muscle biofeedback, you would see the shoulder be slightly up. That's the chronic tension. The person is unaware of it. Maybe by the end of the day, by the end of the week, by the end of the month, they may become aware of the discomfort. Unless you use some physiological monitoring, that's going to be the easiest. Or you have coaching, like such as the Alexander technique, where they would teach you how to be more upright while working. But for most people, they'd be unaware. So one way to do this, if I my shoulder is slightly up, I don't know it's up, it's just that there. However, if I now do a different task, I get up, I bring my, short, my arm backwards for a moment, these same muscles that were up are now being let go and relaxed in most cases. And so it's an unawareness by using the muscles in different and different muscles that it works. So as you're sitting here, as most of us are forward, just for a moment, just roll your shoulders back. And probably as you start to do this, you held your breath for a moment, uh, you know, or maybe bring your chin slightly down for a moment and then pull your neck back and let your shoulders drop. Or it's almost unimportant. I mean, it may be important which ones are better exercises. It's probably the most important to do some alternation of things you don't do. And that is what I said earlier in the, in the podcast about the typist. Embedded in the typist task were the frozen body position of sitting. And then the typist got up to put the paper in. They got up to file. They also look what I'm doing with my arm. It's different. So when the arm drops down, it relaxes. We really forget how much tension many of us hold in our neck and shoulders. Yes. And with, especially with our eyes. Let me do an, uh, let's just show how much tension our eyes affect our, our neck. Take your fingers and just put them just... I think I have to see if I can get it on my screen. I should be careful how I do it here. I put it right, right at my neck, just like this. I'm looking and I put my fingers, feel the muscles right at the base of my skull. Just observe them so they're not too tight. And now I like you just to look with your eyes to the extreme right and then to the extreme left, back and forth. And as you're doing it, are you holding your breath? Keep breathing. Good enough. And what you may have noticed is as you look to the right, you could feel your neck muscles tightening. If you look to the left, you could feel your neck muscles tightening. We have no idea we're doing this. And when we're doing it at the screen going forward, we do the same thing, except now our neck muscles are tight. We're unaware. So if we can alternate tasks, we allow these muscles to relax. Yes. You know, and it's funny. no different, you know. Think how many hours we just sit and slouch. If I think even of ergonomics, so now I have gotten the best perfect chair. I'm sitting perfectly erect. My spine is perfect, you know, slight lower curve. You know, I'm just really nice. 
The trouble is that the disks are all sitting like this and gravity is slowly increasing the pressure on the disks. And after a while, I feel miserable. I cannot sit in the same position for a long time. Life is alternation of movement. So I, by changing positions, I activate, I can lubricate, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Right. And we give other muscles the opportunity to take over rather than overusing the same ones like our lower back. So, you know, we're always, when we, like in the Alexander Technique, you know, community, you know, we try to encourage our students not to kind of push from the lower back to get up to kind of create this wave, but rather to move from the joints so, and that's so much also about what you talk about. I know because I, I got to the privilege of listening to you speak about biofeedback, which I think is, is just the new, the new anecdote to uh, smoking. <laughs> you know, it's just the sitting smoking um, because it's, it's got so much information. And I think it's something that can be used with so many other modalities to have that kind of feedback with uh, biofeedback. It's just, hopefully it will become more widely known and widely used. It, it is becoming more widely, widely known and used now, but um, it, it would be, I think also for the Alexander Technique community, that article that we collaborated on was such a hit because it's really something that would give us so much more information also as teachers. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I'm always impressed when people get feedback and the Alexander teacher, gives you feedback with your fingers mm -hmm. and, and, and language. It's very powerful. What makes biofeedback possible sometimes, it makes the unaware aware. It makes the invisible visible. Right. And the other part is that there are some devices now that you can use that will give you continuous feedback while you're working. And that is the piece. I, I mean, I wish I could take an Alexander teacher home and sit next to me to remind me to be <laughs> tall and upright and expanded and, you know, widening my shoulders. I forget. And what sometimes the feedback does, it's like the posture feedback of the upright or the one we now use is called, you know, which I'm exploring with colleagues as a research study. It's, it's where you, the camera is used of the computer to monitor your posture and it tells you when you're slouching down. It's an upright desktop. It's an experimental one, an app, but it's, it helps our students. And when they do that, what do they report? Well, during while they're studying, it keeps reminding them. Oh, you're slouching. It doesn't mean they sit upright. But what they do is they may wiggle and move just to get out of their slouch. And when they do that, they report a significant decrease in discomfort and pain. You know, compared to the, we just presented this data. So it's very exciting. And I think to me, these tools of biofeedback ought to be part of many practices because they're ways for the person to become aware of what they're doing. And then you can have a teacher or other colleagues to guide you how to use yourself in the best way of doing. Yes, that's, that's the thing is that especially now many of us can't be with teachers right. or mentors or coaches, it's all online. And um, that's the thing with biofeedback is that it, it gives it to you and it's the proof because oftentimes when you have a student or client or patient and you tell them, look, you've got, you know, so-and-so tension, you've got this. No, I don't. I feel great. You know, I've got great posture, whatever, you know, they say, well, actually, here you go. <laughs> let's take a look and let's, and then you've got the proof. And I think that would be so helpful for people because because it's oh wow you know I didn't realize that that aha moment and that's what that that's what biofeedback gives I think which yes. is wonderful so all right one last question and then I'm going to let you go even though I don't really want to let you go but I'm going to have to uh, but your your book um, gives in my opinion the best comprehensive list of just tips advice that I've ever read about ways to just move better, be better. These are so easy to implement. They're so effective. So many of them I've never even heard of before. The ones that I loved the most were the ones with sleep. The technology affects, excessive technology usage and sedentary you know, lifestyle, this affects sleep patterns. So you give some incredible tips for you know just sleeping better. Can you just give a few, uh, if you remember off the top of your head, that you like. I'll just give basically one or two. Okay. One, one on any screen time. There is the phenomenon of the blue light a little bit. Mm 
-hmm. which affects people differently. Some people really, it has no effect to be really honest, mm -hmm. you know, but basically blue light, which is what all screens project or so many of our LED lights too. Mm -hmm. What it does, it suppresses our natural melatonin production. That means it, it causes delayed sleep onset overall. I think that's one. That, however, is probably not the most important piece. What happens is that when you go to sleep, you want your think about it just in the evening, whatever time that is for you, your body slowly slows down. Your thoughts are slowing down. And the biggest distinction is that what screens do, it's not even the light, it's what you're reading there, what you're seeing. Oh my God, think of yesterday's election. How can I go to sleep? My brain <laughs> keeps being, being disturbed. So the content is critical. Or I look at, it reminds me for tomorrow, going to sleep, probably one of the major pieces, I must feel safe. If I don't feel safe, it's just more difficult to go to sleep. Then there are all kinds of rituals which have now become more difficult because now, especially for younger people or students, you know, they used to, or people, they have their bedroom, but now with COVID, many of them are now working in all different rooms at home where one works in one room, one goes to school in the other, one is teaching in the other, one is taking a class in the other, whatever it is working. And sometimes the bedroom now is not just a bedroom, the place where you regenerate sleep. Now it's a tired place where you, in the same bedroom, you're working, you're watching videos. And what you really want to do is realize sleep is a conditioned process to a large extent. That when you go to sleep, it's a ritual. And whether you have your glass of hot milk or whatever it is, I don't care what it is, you know, whatever you do, it's a kind of ritual. Develop that ritual. Make the bed, make your sleep area sacred. If you are working in your bedroom, which many people now need to do because they have space issues as they are using the screens, make, make a place just like people do in traditional cultures where they have a, a little temple in their house. So what you do is if you're going to be working in your bedroom, put something behind your screen for a moment, like a different picture or a, a, some really symbolic thing that says, I am now entering my workspace. And now you see beyond your screen, you see this different background, that is your workspace. And when you're done, cover your workspace. And then now it becomes your bedroom. Those are very simple cues, but they're really useful because that's called cue conditioning. You know, there are so many other things we can do, but I would highly recommend Look back, what are you doing when you're going to sleep? Really reduce screen exposure for the last half an hour, 45 minutes. And it's also content. And if you, you know, and that is critical. And then there are other mechanisms, but I think those are the, the most two common ones I would recommend to start. Those are wonderful. I love, I love the the one about especially creating like a sanctuary for your bedroom. So I, I agree with you and I, I, there's a no working in the bedroom kind of policy. Uh, I, I agree. I think it's really important. And there's nothing wrong with waking up at night. You know, that's the whole other problem. Just say, okay, I need to go to the bathroom or whatever. Just be sure that if you do go get up at night, don't turn on any lights. Now you would say, oh my God, then I'm worried about falling, <laughs> which is true. Then I would say, in that case, turn, put in some right, red lights in the house because that light will not suppress the melatonin. And finally, I guess in historical times, we would all sleep in the total darkness, except during the full moon, basically reestablish darkness at night. The little flashing lights from our chargers to the cars passing by our neighborhood really make your bedroom totally a blackout. I highly recommend that yeah. because then that supports it. And lower the temperature. <laughs> slightly cooler bedrooms allow better sleep. Yeah. Oh, wonderful, wonderful advice. Eric, thank you. It's so great to catch up with you. And it's always so much fun. You are a delight. You have a wealth of knowledge. And you're so generous with sharing your knowledge. Thank you so, so much. Is there anything else that you would like to, to share with our viewers or listeners? That I think myself, if Rick Harvey and Nancy Faust pulled together a number of useful tips and concepts. And do remember that much of our health is an exaggeration almost, or the activation of previous survival mechanisms. 
And if we can understand that, then we can say, oh, there's a different way of looking at it. And the key is to start taking charge of yourself, you know, initiate versus just respond. Yes. Absolutely. I love that. Food for thought. Thank you so much, Eric. Wishing you a wonderful and happy and healthy new year. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, Tommy, and I look forward to seeing you again. Me Take too. Care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.